Yeah, yeah, go, go around over here. Just sort of move quietly, and you can probably make and sneak over there and get a shot. See, see the pigeons? <laughs> I, I hunt pigeons right here with a pellet gun. Not city pigeons. They're called rock pigeons, I think. They're a different breed. Okay. So here's here's two pigeon breasts. This this vacuums it and seals it. Hunters use this thing. It's, it's a brilliant device. I don't know how it works. So it sucks the air out of it and then it seals it. Technology has changed, but the old method of doing them is really works in most situations. Oh wow, you have a loom. Yeah, it's a loom. They stopped making this model in the 40s, so it's just been working for people ever since, and I just have to replace these canvas straps on it. I've always had an urge to make things for myself. That's sort of always been our aim here, was to work with basic things. Kind of, you know, we like having chickens and growing a lot of vegetables, not all of our vegetables. There's some things uh, like scarlet runner beans actually are perennials and they'll grow back from the same root every year. It's, you know, a great way to spend your time if you enjoy it. You don't have to have a piece of land in the country. I mean, even here, we have half an acre. And, you know, pretty much everything we want to do. This chicken coop, it's got a living roof. This is where they hang out at night. And then they go into those nests and lay eggs. Looks like she just dropped an egg. So you get quite a few eggs. We do. And it's a pretty easy thing to have. Yeah, yeah, the chickens are, are easy. You know, you can, and you can have them in the city if it's okay with your neighbors. You just don't want to have a rooster. <laughs> Half an acre is about, it's about 100 by 200 feet. So, you know, we've got, we've got a, a fair amount of food coming out of the garden, all our own eggs. This is the best crop of corn we've ever had. These are hollyhock flowers that make natural dyes, and I'm just collecting them from my hollyhock plant. Leslie's got a weaving room and a sewing room, and we've got a greenhouse and compost bins. All the garden scraps go in here, and then it gets turned over into this one, and then it gets turned over a third time, and by that time it's good soil. I've got a shop. It's all my screws, you know, my nuts and bolts. And I just saved crap all through the years. These are door hinges here. And then small hinges are in this drawer. Because you built your house. Yeah. Yeah, I built it in 1971. I kind of gravitate towards craftsmanship. Here's my father's nuts and bolts box. <laughs> you still have your father. Yeah, yeah. You have to find the line between the modern world and craftsmanship. About You can't take forever, but at the same time, maybe some things from the past are going to be useful today. This is a sourdough-based dough that I feed. This is just the starter, and I started with a small amount of flour and water sitting in my kitchen for several days. It's just the bacteria that's in your kitchen. It's in the air and, and obviously on all the counters and everything. And uh, you can just then add flour and a little, you know, they sell sourdough starters, but you can start with water and flour in your kitchen, incorporating really the bacteria that's in your kitchen. So it's local. And it's just kind of fun to do that. And I've actually kind of worked it so I can make really all of our bread. I make bread maybe every other week. 
I just mixed it up, let the sourdough develop for a couple of hours, and now I'll let it sit for a few more hours. It'll rise very nicely. When we first lived out here, there weren't bakeries or anything, so it was something more where you had to provide for yourself. And I've just kind of, as time has gone on, enjoyed the process. I mean, the idea really is to use your hands. They haven't invented anything better than these, and a computer isn't going to build your house for you. I like building every place I've ever lived, and, and I like the idea of shelter. I built this here out of used wood. When I was 12 years old, I, I helped my dad build a house. And I got to hammer the boards down on the roof, and I loved it. You know, I loved pounding the nails in and the smell of the wood. That's a hexagon, and so I put shakes on there about 30 years ago that I made from driftwood. When I got out of the Air Force in 1960, uh, I just I couldn't find a house to buy. It was just cheaper to build. I'd been using used lumber ever since I started building. I just like to use lumber. Treasure Island is a Navy base in the San Francisco area, and they were tearing down the, the barracks. Most of the lumber in this room is from there. This was the flooring. The two by six uh, rafters there are joists from the floor, and the sheathing on that it was subfloor in these barracks. And this is used Douglas fir uh, wood. The table over there is actually uh, built out of used girders from a horse stable. This is like three by tens. A friend had a joiner, so we were able to mill it so the ends were perfect and laminated three pieces together. Use Douglas fir, use Douglas fir, four by fours. And I've never put a cross piece across here, which it really should have, but the table's pretty solid. I don't know if I showed you the sink. I got this for $100 in a used lumber yard. It's a stainless steel, it's out of a drugstore. And the thing that's great about it is that it drains into the sink. The nails up there where we hang our utensils, okay, those are finished nails. And I got somebody that really got on my case about that, or said, you know, this is so crude. It was like a Dwell Magazine person. You know, it's so simple. You just drive a finishing nail. You know, you imagine in these $2 million houses having anything that simple and that useful. This room in here, this was kind of based on getting used windows. There's such a difference of opinion about housing, about shelter. There are people like us who want to have their home be a good feeling place, to have it be warm, to have it be a place where you cook and eat and sleep and get well if you're ill. And the best way to get those things is to do it yourself. Yeah, homework is the 11th printing. Shelter's, you know, like the 20th printing. But anyway, here's, here's tiny homes. This is great because it's all recycled material and it, they're in Texas mm -hmm. and they're based on the designs of, of farm buildings around Austin. Um, you know, here's in the backyard in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, it costs $300 to build this little place. Th these books are kind of a succession of one thing leading to another. Here is this very rare book. That was the first one. I think the whole Earth catalog was, it was like all this stuff was going on. It was Stuart Brand uh, chronicling what was happening in those, in those years. Buckminster Fuller was a very big part of it. Uh, chainsaw for making your own lumber, you know, teepees. I was building domes and I hooked up with Stuart Brand and I, and I became the shelter editor of the whole Earth catalog and I learned how to make books. The first book I did was this one here, Dome Book One. And it was basically a bunch of hippies building domes out in the California hills, uh, high school kids. Um, and, the, and this book sold out immediately, 5,000 copies. And then we went back to press with this one here. And by this time, we had distribution through Random House. 
and it just went, it went viral for those days. And we ended up printing 160,000 copies until I figured out the domes didn't work. So I had to admit that I was wrong in front of all these people. And I then did this book here because I had a pretty big audience. And this book has sold about a quarter of a million copies now. This is a Korean translation of our book, Builders of the Pacific Coast. Now, why the Koreans would do a book that's a regional book on California and British Columbia and Washington, and why the Koreans would pick up on it, I don't know, but they, so there's, there's something going on all over the place uh, right now, you know, uh, uh, you know a, a renaissance, I think. A straw bale house, you know, this is step-by-step -step construction with Bill and Athena Steen. And then the other thing is when you build the place, you're going to save about half if you do the work yourself. Because it's kind of like, it used to be anyway, like 50% materials, 50% labor. And so I've never owed any money to a bank, and so that's been a huge. And I've, and I've never paid rent. So that's just to start with. I mean, the, pro the problem is you've got to find the time to do it. But back then it was, I mean, we were living on $250 a, a month, two of us. That, that covered our expenses. You know, growing a lot of our own food. If you want, I'll show you this greenhouse yeah, back sure. here. We just put this one up last week. It's really quick to put up. And we're going to extend it one more. But it, the thing is, it's, 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 it's got headroom. She's growing tomatoes and hot weather peppers, cucumbers. We have a foggy climate, so that th these kind of plants need help. And you can feel it's warmer in here. And we haven't even put this end up yet. It's really basic, isn't it? Yeah. And it's movable. This is a raised bed here. Leslie builds these things. She takes a quarter inch mesh and puts it on the ground and then stacks two concrete blocks around it. It's sealed off from the gophers. With self-sufficiency, you never get there. You never become self-sufficient. I mean, we tried back in the 70s. Well, there used to be goats here. And goats are, you know, dairy animals are really hard. I mean, I, I respect dairy farmers because you have to get up every morning. You have to work whether it's raining or whether it's Christmas or, you know, whether you've got a cold. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's daily. It's, it's morning and afternoon. You've got to milk them. And, and this is just too small a piece of land for goats. Really? Kristen, see, see the pigeons? Oh, wow. These are the pigeons you hunt? Yeah. They're a native pigeon. They're not just a city. Yeah, let's see, they're coming down. Actually, if, let's go around, let's go in this way, around this way, because we can see them from the, you can see them from the breakfast room. If we walk that way, they're going to take off. Okay. It's, they sound like a helicopter when they take off. I think in the 60s, a lot of people, a lot of hippies got really carried away with, you know, doing things the old way, and it, and it, and it typically didn't last. You do everything for yourself, try to raise all your own food, and then they just got tired of it. When I planted wheat and went through the whole process, planting the seed to getting flour, it was just really complicated. And I, I realized, well, you've got, to do, you've got to do nothing but wheat if you're going to do that, and so I can't be self-sufficient in wheat. You know, like here's the wheat in here. The pantry was from, you know, when we, had, when we were more agricultural. These are oats here. Here's millet. It's a direction, self-sufficiency. So that's a crop for sauerkraut. So you just you do what you can do, as much of it as you can. So it's got a water seal around here. So it's going to smell kind of bad. Leslie hates the smell of it. Uh, it's got stones on it. Oh, she, she, she probably can smell this from the other room. <laughs> It's pretty fermented by now. I mean, that's been over six months, so that's pretty. And all, all you do is put in cabbage and salt. It's just been sitting on the floor. I mean, it's really good for you. It's just the simplest thing to do. It's like a little moat around this side here, so it keeps the air out. It's really good for your digestion. And then here's olives. My brother has olive trees. 
And so again, this is just salt. Now these are over a year old. Put salt and vinegar and rinse it periodically mm -hmm. and put in fresh water and then salt. And these are like over a year and a half old. And then this is the new batch. I haven't really looked at this. Yeah, they're okay. Olives are magic, you know. I mean, this is a magic tree. So it's all this oil, all this food, you know, this wonderful tree. And not much work. Yeah, no. It's, it's so simple to do these things, you know. So this is, uh, this is a poppy seed plant. They're all over the garden. And this is the seed, it's just, I'm drying it and letting them fall out. They call them bread seed poppies. Technically, they're opium poppies, but there's no opium in the seeds. There's really a lot of seeds, you know, you get in one poppy. I just actually, this year, I just started saving the seeds. I thought it's the same thing you buy. It's such a prehistoric kind of thing that people probably did for years and years. And that's, it's fun to think of people doing the same thing I'm doing now, hundreds of years ago, that it was sort of incorporated. They knew so much more. They were so savvy about how to live. And we're kind of... So it takes the grains, called oat groats, and it makes them into oatmeal. So you do that fresh every morning. And so you have really fresh oatmeal. See it? Can you see it coming out of the bottom? Yeah. Yeah. I want to use what I can from the past, but I think you've got to hit the right balance though and not, you know, I mean, like, I don't want to plow the field with horses. You have to find the line between the modern world and craftsmanship. About You can't take forever, but at the same time, maybe some things from the past are going to be useful today. I did spend one summer working with natural dyes, and these are all natural dyes. Brazil wood, onion, indigo, cochineal, which is an but. insect. So this could be Brazil wood, which makes a really great sort of orangey color. These are indigos. This is blue that um, is the indigo plant. And it's very easy. There's all, anywhere you live, there's lots of plants that make yellow. But blue, it sort of takes hotter weather. And I think a lot of what we do is trying to go beyond the tradition. And then sometimes you come back and you realize there's so much value in the tradition and the way that it is. And you can do new, beautiful things with it. And for us, all of people our age, that tradition was cut off a generation or two ago. Food production, uh, fiber, um, the value of actually working, not just trying to figure out how not to work. This is uh, acid dye. We've had to rediscover it. You know, it was all frozen vegetables and fast food is the ideal when we were uh, starting. Yeah, because that was the 50s after World War II, right? And yeah, all. well, I lived in the 50s in England, and uh, I remember, you know, the first frozen vegetable advertisements of this wonderful thing that was... And I mean, sure, there's lots of back-breaking work that we don't really need to beat our clothes on the rocks. Mm -hmm. A Convenience washing machine <laughs> is a wonderful thing, <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, there's lots of other areas where you lose so much, like food, like to take salt, flour, and water, and that's bread. So this has been rising for maybe an hour. Now I'll let it rise a little bit more and then I'll put it in a very hot oven, 500 degrees, for 10, 15 minutes, because they're small loaves. So it's just time. It's Yeah, yeah. It's actually when you get over needing food to be fast, easy, and cheap, <laughs> it makes a big difference in what you can produce.
yeah. sort of the, the hallmark of modern cooking was it's easy, it's cheap. <laughs> Once you realize, and actually time is what develops the texture and the flavor, and a slow rise is better than a fast rise. You can adapt it to what your cycle is. You can start the mix at night, let it sit, do it in the morning, and then let it rise for a large part of the day. And, or you can put it in a plastic bag and put it in the refrigerator until you need it a few days later, make pizza with it. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. 20-ish, and then you could take a look. <laughs> It's a very adaptable system to different rhythms of people's days. And that sort of works for me. I make it at night, mix up with the yeast in the morning, and then by early afternoon, late afternoon, turn on the oven that makes the house warm and bake the bread. Actually, last night I had um, pickleweed salad. The pickleweed grows in all the marshes. So that's the first time in years I've been looking at it and looking at it and finally figured out how to do it. Yeah, look at the seaweed. I just got this last week. And there's a way you can make sauerkraut and use uh, seaweed instead of salt. I actually, I've gotten into wild foods a lot lately. Making pancakes out of cattail pollen. And, you know, wherever I go, there's food around. I'm just learning about, so I'm, I really don't even know what types of seaweed these are. You know, there's ways to treat them and so that you can have them as a snack. So I got the seaweed, I washed it out, I dried it in the sun. There's those snacks that you buy. I mean, they're so good and so expensive, and I haven't figured that out. So what I do with this is I take it and I grind it up. It could be a salt substitute. So you just pulled this out of the... I, I just got it in really, in really clean places uh, in the bay or on the ocean. It's, it's got to be good. You know, it's also like people sometimes get over their allergies by, you know, if you, if you eat the food that grows in your area, then all the air you're breathing and everything, it's all the same thing. People treat allergies by, because it's homeopathic, like you're ingesting a small amount of whatever it is, and then that's allowing you to resist some kind of onslaught. So there, that, 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 that is. Wow. So I sprinkle that on meat and stuff. You know, I think what we try to do is to have as much from as close by as possible. Different things come into the kitchen. I know that my friend was telling me traditionally, he said Italians would go in the hills and collect chestnut uh, pollen to add to their bread to you know, change the flavor. I put my last few batches, because I've started making these simple cheeses, I've been putting whey in there. So all of that, I think, is a contributing factor to the kitchen biome, whatever they call it. What did you do to start your own starter? Um, a couple of years ago now. And you have the same one? Yeah. Yeah, because I haven't bought any bread since then. And that's got a, a really nice crust. And I, like I say, I think you can find the rhythm with your life to fit it in that works really well. And, you know, and it's different every time. That's okay. What we try to do as much local food as possible and as much stuff as we can do as possible. I mean, some people do a lot more than we do, just whatever your circumstances are. You can't be self-sufficient anyway, that's what I learned. I think the more you can do for yourself, the better. Once you sort of break through and think, it doesn't have to be fast, it doesn't have, you know. I mean, to be able to hang your clothes on the line is such a privilege that you've got the time that you can go out and hang up the sheets and the towels. Mm -hmm. And it's just so lovely, mm -hmm. you know, fresh and the laundry smells good. And it's a great thing to be able to do. And some people would do that and some people would rather work more and take an incredible vacation or something. And I don't really take vacations, <laughs> you know, but it's just I like doing all the stuff here I can.
This stuff here doesn't break up well, but the other stuff is like salt. Dryer. See, this is like salt. It's what my message maybe was and is, is that, you know, uh, do it yourself. And if you don't know where to start, start. And things will fall into place. It would be, I mean, it would be so much fun to build another house. I've been thinking lately like a, a shed roof facing south. Mm -hmm. Just one story. We could open up a whole wall if we wanted to outside, mm -hmm. to cook outside. Mm -hmm. And your cob oven for making pizza. Sheep. Yeah, sheep. sheep, sheep. Well, sheep. if we have, if, okay, if we have sheep, I need to have a pig. Fine with me. Okay, that's a deal. <laughs>